This video is sponsored by Eduonics. They're running an exclusive sale for Traversy Media subscribers on their best-selling courses, which are available at just $7 for a very limited period of time. You can learn skills such as machine learning and NLP, web development, programming languages like C++, C Sharp, and Java, DevOps technology such as Docker, and much more. So click the link in the description below to check out Eduonics courses and start building your skills in 2019. Hey, what's going on guys? Welcome to my Rust crash course. So this is going to be an introductory course on the fundamentals and the syntax of the Rust programming language. Now, normally I'll use some slides in my crash courses for frameworks and libraries. However, when we're dealing with an entire programming language, there's uh, quite a bit to get to, even though we're just covering the basics. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about what Rust is, and then we'll jump in. We'll start looking at the course syntax, um, how to install it, look at some of the concepts and so on. All right, so what exactly is Rust? It's an extremely fast and powerful programming language. Rust is best known for being a systems language. Some other examples of systems languages are C, C++, Golang. These are very powerful and fast languages built more for systems rather than application programming languages like Java, C Sharp, JavaScript, and so on. So application programming is basically user-facing software, programs that the users interact with. Things that you would build with a systems language like Rust or C++ would be more like drivers and compilers. Uh, many tools that programmers use in development are built with systems languages. So Rust is great for that stuff. However, I know a lot of you guys are web developers, obviously, if you're subscribers to this channel. Rust is starting to become really relevant in web development because of WebAssembly. Okay, WebAssembly is in its early stages, but looks really promising. If you've never heard of WebAssembly or WASM, it's an efficient, low-level bytecode for the web. Okay, so it's going to allow us to build very secure, portable, and very fast applications, web applications, utilizing languages like C++ and, of course, Rust. So if you want to get into WebAssembly, but you don't want to work with C++, which is a very, very difficult language to work with, then Rust is perfect. So Rust and WebAssembly integrate with existing JavaScript tooling. Uh, it supports, you know, ECMAScript modules as well as tools like NPM and Webpack. I do have plans on creating a Rust and WebAssembly project on YouTube. So this is going to be sort of a precursor to that. Okay, so if you're a web developer wanting to learn what Rust and WASM, or you're just looking to um, learn a, a systems language to build whatever compilers, drivers, uh, stuff like that, then this is kind of an introductory to that. All right, now, one more thing I want to talk about before we get started is garbage collection. One of the biggest advantages to Rust is that it doesn't have garbage collection and you also don't have to manage memory. So, and let me explain what that means. Now in JavaScript, for example, very often it goes through and it looks for variables and objects and other things that are no, that no, no longer have a reference and are no longer needed within that code and it deletes it from memory and it frees up that space. So this can sometimes take multiple seconds depending on the program, um, depending on you know what's being collected. With languages like C and C++, you handle all this yourself, which makes programming much more tedious tedious, much harder. You have to manage all the memory, the allocation and all that stuff. It's very difficult. Now, Rust works in a different way than than both of these. You don't have to manage it yourself, but instead of it automatically checking every few milliseconds or whatever, um, it checks on demand when needed. Okay, so if the memory heap is close to being full or uh, above some threshold, it will then look for variables and so on to free up memory and the compiler takes care of all this for us. So it's very efficient and at the same time, it's not leaving it up to you to allocate memory and all that stuff that you would do with you know C++. Um, so you kind of get the best of both worlds and I think that's what makes Rust an excellent language. And Rust has its own package manager called Cargo, which is similar to, you know, NPM for Node or Composer for PHP, PIP ENV for Python. Every, just about every language has its own package manager to install packages, to track dependencies, all that stuff. So we're going to get into Cargo as well, which comes with Rust. Now to get started, just hit this button here. If you're on Windows, I believe there's an installer that you'll just need to go through. On Mac and Linux, you just have to grab this curl command open up a terminal, paste that in there and run it. 
and just hit one to proceed with the default installation and it will install it. Mine went really fast because I already have it installed. Now you might need to um, just restart your terminal. If you do a let's say rust up dash dash version and it says not found, then just restart your terminal. Now it comes with a couple utilities. Rust up is to it's basically your version manager. If you want to check for updates, you could do rust up um, update and that should see if there's any updates and then, you know, update if, if needed. Um, then Rust C is the compiler. So you can see that we have that installed as well. And then cargo is the package manager. Okay. now what I'm going to do is I'm going to close this up and jump into VS Code. This is the text editor that I'll be using now. Very important. If you're using VS Code, you want to install the Rust RLS extension. Okay, so go ahead and search for Rust and it's going to be the first one and install that. This has, you know, code completion. It's basically a linter for your Rust code. So you definitely want that. So once you have that installed, Uh, I'm just in a, an empty folder called Rust Sandbox and I'm going to be using cargo. But first thing I want to do is just show you how to create a Rust file and compile it. So I'm going to open up without cargo. So I'm going to open up a terminal here, uh, integrated terminal, and I'm just going to create a new file called hello.rs and we're going to open that up. And inside of our Rust application, we need an entry point. We need a main function. So we're going to say fn main. Okay, so we're creating a function called main and then I just want to print out hello world. So the the command that we're going to be using for the most part in this course to print out stuff is going to be print line or print ln exclamation. Okay, and then in here we're just going to put in some double quotes and we'll just say hello world and save. All right. Now if we want to compile this and run it, we can use the rust c utility directly so we can just say rust c hello and then the file name or hello.rs so we'll run that and now you can see it's created this executable up here so if i want to run that directly from the command line i can simply do dot slash hello and it runs the application and we get hello world in the console Okay, so I mean, that's you know, you can create a Rust file, you can compile it with Rust C. However, that's not really what how you would do it in the real world. You want to initialize your project with cargo and do things that way. So I'm going to just delete um, both of these files right here. All right. Now to initialize a project with cargo, there's a there's a couple different ways we could do cargo new and then a folder name like hello. And what that would do is create a new project in a folder called hello. However, I want to initialize everything in this Rust sandbox folder. So I'm going to do cargo init. All right. And then if we look over here, you'll see that we have this file structure and we have a cargo .toml file. Now I have an extension called better toml, which will give us the, the highlighting here. If you don't have it, this will just be all white. Now this has just some information like the name, the version, very similar to like a pip file for Python or um, a, a package.json for Node. It just has all your application info and any dependencies that you have. Okay, so I'm not going to touch this file. I just wanted to show it to you. And then it gives us a git ignore, which has the target folder, because that is basically when we when we run the compiler, our files will go into there. And that's not something you want to push to GitHub. Or, or wherever you're, you're pushing it. Um, and then our source folder is where all of our Rust code goes. So you can see there's a main.rs file that basically just has the same thing that, that we created in the hello file. Now, when we want to compile this, we don't use the um, Rust C utility directly. We use cargo and we can say cargo run. What that's going to do is it's going to compile it and it's also going to run it. You can see hello world is printing out here. Now it compiled into this target folder and then into debug and right here Rust sandbox. Okay, so if I wanted to run this, I could go into uh, we could say dot slash target slash debug slash Rust underscore sandbox and that will run the actual um, executable. Now If you just want to build it out and you don't want to run it, you can do cargo build. 
Okay, so you can see it's not printing out hello world. However, it did build it. Now, if you want to build for production, then you want to do cargo build dash dash release. Okay, when you do that, you'll see it says finish released optimized. Okay, so it'll optimize it for production and then in target, you'll see there's a release folder and then that's where the the executable is okay for deployment. So that that takes care of compiling. Now I'm going to clear this up and I'm going to structure this folder in a way that you can go back to it for reference. So we're going to create a sandbox and I'm going to create a new file for every basically every topic that we cover. So first topic I want to cover is this print line command and formatting. So in the source folder, I'm going to create a new file called print.rs. Now, what we can do is create a function in this print file and then run it in our main uh, main RS file. So I'm going to go pub, which is a uh, uh, means public. So public function, because I want to be able to access this from outside uh, public function. And for each file, I'm going to create a run function just to run it. And let's first just do a print to console. So I'm going to do the same thing, just do a print LN exclamation. And let's just say hello from the print RS file. Okay, so we'll save that and then in main.rs what we want to do is go above the main function and just simply say mod and then the name of the file which is print. Okay? And by the way, semicolons are required in Rust. And then down here, uh, let's get rid of this. And we can simply say print double colon and then the function and you'll see it even it even has a drop down with the run function. Okay, so if I save that, we go down here and we say cargo run, we get hello from the print print dot RS file. Okay, so that's what we'll do is for each topic, we'll create a new file, we'll bring it in and we'll run it. So let's head over to the print RS and I want to talk a little bit about formatting. Okay, now in many languages, you can do like uh, You know, you could print out, for instance, uh, an integer, a number like this, and you'll see we're even getting a, a linting error here. But if I save this and I try to run this, we get uh, an error here. It says you might be missing a string literal to format with, <coughs> excuse me, and it even gives us the code that we should be writing. Now, this is what we have to do is use uh, basically a placeholder for anything that for any variable or number or even string, anything at all that we want to replace. We use these curly braces, so we would have to do that. And uh, I'm sorry, we want double quotes has to be double quotes. And then we'll say like um, number and then let's say we want to put the number one here. So we would put that and then the second parameter we would put one. Okay, so I'll save it. You'll see that the red line cleared up. And if we run cargo run, we get number one. Okay, so you can't just directly print line in, in integer or anything like that. Now, let's say we wanted to have multiple placeholders. Like, let's say we wanted to do. Uh, we'll say like Brad is from mass. So over here, I would say Brad. mass. Okay. Now this is going to be replaced with whatever the first value is over here. This will be replaced with the second. Okay. And I use strings here, but this could be a number. This could be, you know, uh, an array index, whatever. So let's save that. Let's run it. And we get Brad is from mass. Okay. So this is formatting. I'll say basic formatting. Now we also have positional arguments. All right, so I'm going to do a print line. And if I if I do autocomplete, you'll see it puts it there for me. Um, but let's say we want to do like Brad is from mass and Brad likes to code. Okay, so I want those variables. Now I'm using Brad twice. <clears throat> so in this case, I would use positional parameters. Over here, let's do 
Brad Mass and uh, let's do lowercase code. All right. So this first one I want to be Brad, which is going to be this this zero index. Okay. so is from mass, which is the second one, which has an index of one. And then I want Brad again. So I want to use zero and then code is in the index of two. Okay, it's zero, one, two. So let's save that. And I do have the prettier extension installed in VS Code, so it might just kind of format it sometimes like that. So let's run that. We get Brad is from mass and Brad likes to code. So those are positional arguments. We also have named arguments. Okay, so let's do a print line and let's say uh, we can actually put names in here. So I'm going to say name likes to play activity and then I'm going to put in here. Let's do John and let's do uh, I'm sorry, this is wrong. We want to actually set these named parameters. So we'll say name equals John and let's do uh, activity equals baseball. All right, so we'll save that. And if we go ahead and run this, we get John likes to play baseball so we can have named parameters in here if we want. Okay, so you can do positional or named. Now, there's also something called uh, traits or placeholder traits. I'm not going to go over all of these, but I just want to show you that there are these do exist. So, I mean, there's there's one for like binary, hexadecimal, octal. So let's do a print line and let's do we'll say binary. And the trait for binary is going to be colon B. And let's do hex or hexadecimal. Actually, we want to be in here. So hex, we're going to do colon X and let's say octal is going to be colon. Oh, and these are all lowercase. And then we're going to just get these for for the value of 10, 10 and 10. Okay, so it's going to give us the binary for for this one, the hex for this one and octal for this one. So let's run that and there we go. So there's the binary hex and octal. Now we also have the debug trait, which is which comes in handy if um, if you want to print out like an entire array or something like that. So let's say placeholder for debug trait and we'll be using this quite a bit. Um, so we're going to say print line. And this is going to be a colon and then a question mark. Now, with this, I can actually put in multiple values. So I'm going to put another set of curly braces here and let's put like a number. We'll say we'll put a Boolean and I'm going to go over data types in the next uh, in the next file. And then let's put a string of hello. Okay, so if I want to print all those things out. Go ahead and run it and there we go. Okay. Uh, and this is actually called a tuple. So I think that that's pretty much it. Oh, we can do basic math too. And I guess I'll put this in here. So we'll say print line and let's do like uh, 10 plus 10 equals. And then over here we can actually put in the expression 10 plus 10. Okay, and whatever the whatever this equals is going to get put into this right here. So let's save that. Let's run that and we get 10 plus 10 equals 20. All right. So I think that's good for formatting and, and for this print line. We'll be using this all throughout this course. So let's close that up. And let's see. Uh, yeah, the next thing I want to look at actually before we look at types, I want to look at variables, just how to create them. We have um, variables are immutable by default, which is something that's a little different than a lot of other languages. So let's go ahead and create a new file here called vars.rs. And let's create 
our run function. And I just have some stuff that I want to paste up here, just some information. I might do this in a couple different files. So variables hold primitive data or references to data. Variables are immutable by default, meaning that by default you can't reassign them. Okay, Rust is also a block scoped language, meaning that, you know, if you set a variable in a function, it's it's it pertains to that scope. All right, so let's go ahead and create a variable. Now we use the let keyword. Okay, and if you're a JavaScript developer, um, this probably looks very familiar. So we're going to say let name equals and let's set to Brad. Okay, now I'm going to go ahead and do a print. line here and I'm going to say my name is and then over here we'll put in name. Okay? Remember, we can't just we can't do print line, print line and just put in name. It won't let us do that. But let's save that, go to main and I'm going to comment out this and we want to bring in vars. Okay? And then we want to go down here and I'll, I'll go ahead and comment this out and let's bring let's say vars run. Okay? And then we'll go down here and we'll do cargo run and we get my name is Brad. <clears throat> Now, if I want to reassign this, if I say name Actually, you know what we'll do? We'll keep that. Let's let's do another variable and let's do age. Okay? Cuz name is something that probably won't change. Age, however, will. So, let's say age equals 37. All right, and then down here I'll say my name is Brad and I am and then we'll put in here age. Okay, so that will work. My name is Brad and I'm 37, but let's say I have a birthday and I want to change age now to 38. We go ahead and run that. If I do that, we get this error, cannot assign twice to a mutable variable. Okay? So a mutable basically means you can't mutate it. You can't you can't reassign it. Um in for you JavaScript developers, it's basically like using const. Now, we can make this mutable. All we have to do is simply add <coughs> excuse me, is add mute. Okay? M U T. Now, if we save this and run it, It says my name is Brad and I am 38. Now we do get a warning just saying value assigned to age is never read because where we where we put it to 37, we never used it when it was 37. However, if I take this and I copy it and put it up here and we use that when it was 37, we won't get that warning anymore. Okay? So now we get 37 and 38. So that's how immutable variables work in Rust. Now, there is actually a const keyword as well. Oops, what's going on here? Let me clear this out. So there is a const keyword which you don't use that much, um but it, they do exist. So let's go ahead and say define uh constant. Okay, so we can say const and let's do id. Usually an id doesn't change. Now, when you use const, you do have to explicitly um define a type. So let's define this as an integer 32 bit. Okay? And we're going to set this to 001. Now, down here I'm just going to do a print line and let's say id and then we'll go ahead in here and we'll put in um id. Okay, so if we save that, that should work. So you'll see ID1. So we can use const. Um usually it's going to be all uppercase when you do use const and you do have to add a type. All right. Now, last thing I want to show you in this file is that we can assign multiple variables at once. Okay, so I can do for instance let and then some parentheses and I can say like let's do my name my age we can set that equal to another set of parentheses and let's do brad and 37 and then we'll go ahead and do a print line and we'll say curly braces is curly braces and then here we'll pass in my name 
my age. All right, so let's run that. And then down at the bottom here, you'll see Brad is 37. So we can assign multiple variables at once. Okay, so now that we've gone over how to assign variables, how they're immutable, but we can make them mutable. Let's look at data types. So I'm going to create a new file called types.rs. Keep wanting to put JS. And then uh, let's go ahead and do pub function run. And in our main J, uh, <laughs> main RS, we're going to copy this down, comment that out and let's bring in types. Okay, and then we'll run types run. Okay, so in this types file, I'm just going to paste in some stuff here. So I'm going to paste in the primitive types of Rust. Okay, so as far as integers, we have unsigned integers of different bits, and then we have uh, just regular integers. So most commonly, you'll probably use I, uh, I32. Um, unsigned just means that The, there's no negative values. It's a, you can't have negative numbers. Integers can be positive or negative. Um, and the number is just the number of bits they take in memory. Okay, so the larger the number, the more the bits. Floats, you have uh, 32 and 64. Boolean is bool. You also have char or car, which is just, it's one character. Okay, it's not a string. Strings are, are kind of weird, actually, in Rust, and I'm going to talk about strings afterwards. Um, you also have tuples, which are basically uh, lists, and then you have arrays, which are also primitive types. But arrays in Rust are a fixed length. Okay, you have something called vectors, which are um, basically growable arrays, and we'll, we'll talk about those after. Um, I'm not even going to get into tuples and arrays in this file here, but these are primitive types of Rust. Now, I'm going to paste in another little tip here, and that is that Rust is a, is a statically typed language, which means that it must know the types of all variables at the time of, of compile. However, the compiler can usually infer what type we want to use based on the value and how we use it. So it's not required that you set the type for every single variable you, you create. It's going to infer what that type is going to be. Um, you know, sometimes it might be wrong and it might complain. But, you know, for instance, if I do. Let uh, we'll do let X equals one. So by default. This is going to be an I32, okay, an integer 32. I don't have to I don't have to explicitly define that. Now for a float, let's do let um, y equals and we'll say 2.5. So by default, this is going to be a float 64. So it's going to be F64 by default. Now, if we want to do an explicit type, so let's say add uh, expl great spell explicit type. So let's say we want to do um, an I64. So I'll say let Y and then to add a type, we do a colon space and then let's do I64 and we'll say equal and we'll do some large number. Okay, so we can do that. Now, if you want to find the max size of, let's say, an, an integer 32 or 64, we can do that. So let's say find max size. Uh, we can do print line. And let's say max I 32. And then we want for the placeholder, we're going to use um, STD. So basically the standard library, we need to bring this in. So we're going to say STD uh, double colon I 32 and then double colon max. Okay, so that will give us the max for I 32. Uh, and then I'm going to copy that down. Let's do the same for 64. All right, so we'll save that and let's go to main RS. Oh, we already did that. Okay, so let's run cargo run. 
Um, consider using underscore. Oh, I used Y twice. We'll just call this one Z to get rid of that warning. But anyway, if we look down here, this is the max for an in I32. So if you're going to use a number larger than this, then you want to use I64. Okay, and you can look at the max for like floats and all that stuff as well if you want. So next we'll take a look at setting a, a Boolean. So a Boolean is obviously true or false. So we'll do like let is active and we'll set that to true. And down here, let's do a print. LN and let's use our debug placeholder here. So colon question mark and we'll just print out some of this stuff that we've we've created up here. So let's do like um, X, Y, Z is active. Okay, we'll go ahead and run that and we get one, two point five, this big number here and then true. Now for the Boolean, uh, it, it it inferred that it's a Boolean, but we could explicitly set it. So I could do uh, bool like that. Okay, so that'll still work. Uh, let's see. We can also get a Boolean from an expression. So if we were to do like let is oh, and by the way, this the convention for variables is underscore. You're not going to see like uh, camel case too much here in Rust. So let's do is greater. is greater and let's set that to 10 is uh, greater than 5. Okay, so what should happen is it should evaluate this and put that value either true or false in here and we can explicitly set this if we want like that and then let's put in is greater. Okay, so we'll clear this up or in cargo want cargo run and we get true. If I were to change this to less than and we run it now, we get false. Okay, so last thing I want to show you is is a character or char, which is a Unicode character. So, for instance, let's say let um, a one and set it to and we're going to use single quotes. This is how you signify a, a, a car or char with single quotes. So if I go down here and let's put in a one, <clears throat> excuse me, and we run this, we get a as a as a char. Now it has to be just one character. If I put a B, you'll see it already gives me an error. Character literal may only contain one code point. Now this could be any Unicode. In fact, um, emojis are Unicode. So I could even do like let face. And we can specify this with a um, slash U. So we're going to say Unicode and then inside curly braces, I'm going to use one F 600. And this is like a, it's a smiley face or something like that. So I'm going to save. Actually, let's go add it down here so we can see it and we'll say face and then let's clear this up and run it. And you'll see that we get a little smiley emoji face. Okay, and you can look these Unicodes up online. Just type in emoji Unicode and you can find these. All right, so I think that's good for primitive types. So now we're going to look at strings, talk about those for a little bit and also look at some string methods. So I'm going to create a new file and I'm going to call it strings dot RS and let's create our public function run. Okay, and we'll go ahead and bring this into main.rs. So I'm going to copy this down and let's bring in strings. And then down here, we want to run strings run. Okay, so I'm actually going to just paste something in here real quick that I want to talk about. So there's there's two types of strings really there you have a primitive string which is immutable it's a fixed length string somewhere in memory um, so what we've been doing with strings so far we've been using 
uh, primitive strings, but you also have the string type, which is a, a growable heap allocated data structure okay, that you can use when you need to modify or own string data. So if you want to push something onto a string, you can do that as if it were like, let's say, an array or something like that um, or a vector rather in Rust. And we'll get to arrays and vectors in a little bit. Now, as far as creating a string, I mean, we can do like, you know, let uh, hello equals hello like that. And this is this type. Okay, so it's a mutable fixed length. If we want to create this string that's a growable heap allocated data structure, then we want to do string and then we want double colon from and then we put in we put in our parentheses and whatever we want as the string. Okay, so I can go down here and we can print line and let's just print hello. And if we clear this up and run it, we get hello. All right. Now, if we want to get the length, let's say get get length, we can use the len method, which will actually work for either type, you know, primitive string or this type of string. Um, so let's do print line and let's say length and then we can do hello dot len okay so if we run that we get length 5 now using this type of string we can actually add on to it now there's two methods that there's a push method and there's a push str or push string the push is for the char type which remember is just a single unicode character. So if we wanted to, we could do hello dot push. And let's say we wanted to push a unicode character. I'm actually going to put a space hello space here and then let's put a W like that. Now it's giving me this error here because it says um, cannot borrow hello as mutable as it's not declared as mutable. So we just simply have to go up here and say that this is a mutable variable. Okay, so now that should work. If we run it, we get hello W. Now, if I try to put an O in here, automatically we're going to get an error. It says character literal may only contain one code point because this push method is for characters. Now, if you want to push more than that, then you want to use push string or push str. So let's do hello dot push underscore str. Okay, and then we want to put in our double quotes and let's do O R L D exclamation. So now if we run that, we get hello world. All right. So we'll say this will push on a char and this will push a string. Now we, we wouldn't be able to use these if we just do this, like if we set this to just hello like that and we try to run it, it's not going to work. Okay, um, because it's it's this type. So let's just put that back and let's take a look at some of the other things we can do. Um, we can get the capacity, which is uh, basically the, the 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 number of bytes that it can store. So let's say uh, capacity in bytes. So let's do a print and we'll say capacity. Hello dot capacity. So if we run that, we get capacity is 12. Now we also have is empty if we want to check to see if a string is empty. So we'll do print line. Let's say is empty. Hello dot is underscore empty and there's a ton of methods. I'm obviously not going to go through them all. I just want to show you a couple of them. So here we get is empty and that's false. So I'm just going to put a comment here. We'll say check if empty. Now we can also check to see if it contains some substring using contains. So let's do a print and we'll say Does it contain the word world? So over here we'll say hello dot contains and then we'll pass in world. 
Okay, so this will give us a true or false value. So let's run it and we get contains world true. Now, if we go ahead and take off this D here and we run it, now we get contains world false. Okay, so we can check to see if it contains a substring. We can also replace. And there's really good documentation for Rust. If you want to check that out, if you want to look into more of these, uh, let's do replace. So over here, I'm just going to do hello dot replace. And let's say we want to replace the word world. And then we put in a second parameter. Let's replace it with there. So we'll have it say hello there instead. So we'll go down here. We'll run it. And now you can see for replace, we have hello there. Now we can also loop through strings like let's say we want to loop through by white space. So each word will be put on a new line or, or we can do whatever we want with it. So I'm going to say loop through string by white space so we can use a for loop. I'm going to just going to say word. You can use whatever you want here. A lot of times you'll see a token, but we're going to say for word in hello dot and then we can use split underscore white space so we can split it by the white space. And then let's just do a print line and let's just output the word. Oops, word, not world. Yeah, we'll just do that, I guess. That's fine. All right, put our semicolon in and then let's run it. And we just get hello on one line and then world. Okay, and the more words we put, obviously those would be put on separate lines. Um, let's see, we can also create a string with a certain capacity. So let's say create string with capacity and a lot of this stuff might seem weird. Like when will I ever use this? But remember, Rust is a, it's it's used for systems programming. So you do a lot of different things than you would with like, let's say, JavaScript. Um, so that that's why it has some of these weird rules and some of these um, just stuff that you're not really used to in um, languages like JavaScript. So let's go ahead and just create a, a mutatable string. We'll call it S and we'll set it to a string and we're going to say with capacity. Okay, and then let's just make the capacity 10. Now I'm going to take that string and just push on to it a character. So you single quotes here. So a character literal is just one uh, Unicode character. Let's do a and then let's do B. And then if we were to print this out, uh, let's just put in here S. Okay, so if we run that, we should just get a B, which you can see right here. Um, I'm just going to get rid of this last print. So we get a B. Now, I actually want to show you how to write assertions, and this doesn't have to just do with strings. This is just if you want to test to see if something is equal to something else. Basically, is the left equal to the right? So let's say assertion testing and the method that we're going to use here is assert right here, assert underscore equal or EQ exclamation. And it just takes in two parameters and it matches the left to the right. So let's say we want to make sure that Um, two is the value for the length of the string. So S dot L E N. Okay. Now, if I save this and we run it, nothing happens because it passed. Okay. It's only going to show us an error if it fails. So let's go ahead and change this to three and go ahead and run that. And the assertion fails. So it says three thread main panicked at assertion failed left equals right. Left is three. Right is two. Okay, and it tells us where it failed. So this is something that is very helpful uh, that you probably use quite a bit in Rust programming. So let's say let's put that back to two and then I'm going to copy it down and let's say let's match 10 to the capacity because remember we set the string capacity to 10. So we'll say capacity. Oops, don't want to do that. And if we save that and run it, okay, nothing happens. If we change the capacity to let's say 11 and we run it, then the assertion fails. Okay, so this is very helpful if you want to check to see if something is is equal to something else. 
All right, so that's I'm just going to stop here for strings. There's a lot more methods uh, that you can you know, look in the documentation and, and check out. But we're going to move on to tuples. So I'm going to create a new file here called tuples dot uh, not JS RS. And let's do our public function run. And we'll go ahead and bring tuples in here. So I'm going to cop comment that out and bring in tuples. And then down here. Let's say tuples. All right. Now a tuple is pretty simple. It's basically just um, a group of, of values. So I'm just going to paste this in real quick. So they're uh, tuples group together values and they can be different types. So they don't all have to be the same types like an array um, max 12 elements. So that's the most you can have in a tuple. So for instance, let's create a tuple called person. Now we need to add the types first. So we're going to put colon and then parentheses. And I'm going to I'm just going to do my name, location and age as a value. So first one is going to be. Uh, a string literal, which is going to be ampersand str. So let's do next one ampersand str. And then let's do make the last one an 8 bit um, number, which can be 0 to 255. Okay, and then we're going to set equals to parentheses and then we put the actual value. So let's say Brad mass and then 37. Okay, so to access these, let's do a print. And let's do Brad is from mass and is and then a placeholder. Now to access, let's say the first value, which is Brad, we're going to put in person dot. Okay, we want to use this dot syntax and you can see in VS Code, it knows that the person tuple has three values. So we want the first one, which is zero. Then we'll do person dot one and then we'll do person dot two. Okay, so if we save that and we run our main file, we get Brad is for mass and is 37. Okay, so that's that's pretty much it. Tuples are pretty simple to understand. So the next thing I want to look at is arrays. So we'll go ahead and save that and let's create a new file called arrays dot RS. Put our public run function. And let's bring in arrays. Comment that out. All right, so save that now. Arrays are actually fixed. Um, the length is fixed, unlike some other languages. So fixed list where elements are the same data types. That's another thing um, we do have vectors, which I'm going to go over next, which are growable arrays. Basically, you can add to them. Um, so let's go ahead and create an array. So I'm going to say let I'm just going to call this numbers and I'm going to set the data type here to int 32. And I'm going to put a semicolon and then the, the length of the array, which is going to be five. Okay, and then we're going to set some brackets and let's do one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so we have an array of five elements. Uh, let's see why is okay. So this green line just means that it's not being used. Um, now what I'm going to do is just print this out. So let's say print line. Now, if we want to print out the whole array, we're actually going to use the debug trait here. So it's going to be an exclamation and then a question mark. And then let's just put in numbers. Okay, so that should print out the whole thing. So let's go down here. Let's run our file and it shows that we have one, two, three, four, five. Now, if I take out the last one here and I run this, it's giving us an error because as you can see, It expected an array with a fixed size of five elements and it found four. So it has to be exact. Also, if I were to change this to, let's say, a string and run this. We get expected in, in 32 bit int. Okay, so the data type 
and the length have to be exact. Now, to get a, a single value, we can just uh, let's copy this down. So let's say uh, get single val and I'm just going to get rid of this. And let's say we want to get the first one. So it's zero index, just like any other array in any other language. So we'll save that. Actually, let's go right here and let's just say single value. Okay, we'll run that and we get single value one. Okay, so similar to just about every other language. Um, now, if we want to add on to this, I'm sorry, not add on. If we want to change one of these, we can do that. We can make this mutatable by just putting MUT here and then let's do. Let's say re assign a value okay with arrays we can't add on to them but we can change values so if i say numbers and let's grab the two index and let's set it to um, i don't know 20 okay if we do that and we go ahead and run now we get one two and then the two index which was three is now 20 okay so we can't we can do that with arrays we can get the length get array length. So if we do a print line and let's just say array length, we can simply do numbers dot len. Okay, so we'll run that and you can see we get five. We can also get um, the amount of memory that it takes up. So I'm going to say Arrays are stack allocated. Oops, allocated. Now with the standard library, we have something called mem. So we can do. Um, actually, let's do a print. And I'm going to say that this array. Occupies. Whoops, placeholder bytes. And then here, let's do STD double colon mem and then we can do another double colon and we can get the size of val. All right, and then we want to pass in a reference to the array of numbers. So we want to do ampersand numbers. All right, and then let's run that. Why? Oh, sometimes the errors take a minute to clear and it's confusing. So we get array occupies 20 bytes. Okay, if I get rid of let's let's change this to four and get rid of one of these and save it. And then we run this again and we get array occupies 16 bytes. Okay, so basically each one of these is going to be four bytes. So um, the, now this STD, the standard library, we brought in mem. If we want, we can. bring that in up here. We can say use STD mem and then down here we can simply say mem and get rid of the STD, which is always a good thing to get rid of STDs. So let's run that and we get the same thing. Okay, so um, this is this is pretty common to bring it in up here and then just use it. Now another thing we can do is we can get slices from an array. So let's say Uh, get slice. So I'm just going to create a mutable mutable variable. Actually, it doesn't need to be mutable. We'll just call this slice and we want to set the type here and we're going to use the ampersand and then brackets and say this is uh, int 32 and then set it to a reference to the array of numbers. So ampersand numbers and we can we can to get the whole thing. In fact, I'll do that first. And then we'll just print. We'll say slice colon and then over here we'll just pass in slice like that. And uh, let's see what's going on here. Oh, since this is since it's an array, it's going to print out. We have to use the debug trait here. Wait, why? why? Oh, there we go. Okay, so slice and you can see we get the whole thing. Now let's say we just want to get 0 to 
we could put brackets here and we can actually do 0 dot dot 2. Okay, so let's see what that gives us. So for now for the slice we just get 0, we just get the first two basically. Okay, so you can kind of slice things out. Um, if we wanted to get let's say 1 2 3 We could do that and then we get 2 and 20. So that's arrays. Now I want to take a look at vectors next, which are arrays that um, you can actually add to and remove stuff from. So let's create a new file. We'll call this vectors.rs and you're, you're probably going to use vectors more than arrays. Um, I'm going to copy. This though, I'm going to copy the whole arrays file and paste it in and just replace some stuff here so vectors are resizable arrays and to define a vector we we can we do it basically the same way except instead of doing this we define it as vec and then inside angle brackets we put the data type which will be i32 and then right before the brackets here we want to put vec exclamation that will define it as a vector. Now we can still reassign values like this. Um, we'll go ahead and print it out. We can get single values. It's going to be the same thing down here. The array length. I'm just going to change this to uh, vector length. We'll say get vector length. And vector. All right, so let's actually save that and let's go to main.rs and let's bring in vectors. Oops. Go down here. Okay. And then we'll clear this up and we'll run this. And you'll see we'll get the same stuff. So we're printing out the the entire vector. We can get a single value. We can get the length, get the number of space, a number of bytes it occupies, slice, and so on. Now, if we want to add to this, we can use push. Okay, so I'm going to go. I'll go right here and let's say add on to vector. So we'll say numbers dot push. And let's add on five. Actually, we'll add another one. Let's do six. Okay, so we'll save that. And if we run it now, we get one to 20 because we did the reassignment four, five, six. Okay, so we can add these on. We can also pop off the last value with the pop method. So if we say numbers dot pop. And we go ahead and run that. Now the six should be gone. So now we just get one through five. Okay, so we can add and remove from vectors. Now, of course, we can also loop through these. I know we haven't gotten to loops yet, but I just want to show you this real quick. Um, so let's do loop through vector values. So we're going to use a for loop and let's just say for x. We're going to use in. So this is a for in and we're going to take numbers and we want to do dot iter. So dot iteration and inside here, let's just do a print line and we'll just do number. And then over here, we'll just put X. Okay, so that should loop through them all and print them out. So let's run it. And then it just prints out one. It just prints out the whole vector. Okay, with the word number before it. Now we can also mutate each value. So let's say loop and mutate values. So basically we can do like 4x in numbers and we're going to do iter underscore mute or mut. And we can do whatever we want. Let's say we want to multiply each one by two. So we do an asterisk X and let's do asterisk equals two. All right. And then what I want to do is just print the whole thing out down here so you can see what it gives us. So I'll say numbers vec and let's put in here numbers. 
All right, so we'll run that and now let's see we get an error here. Cannot be formatted with the default formatter. I keep forgetting if we're going to print out the whole array, we need to do that. So now at the bottom, you'll see numbers vec and we get 2, 4, 48 and 10. So each value has been multiplied by 2. And for those of you guys that are JavaScript developers, uh, this is similar to how map works, really, when you use an array and then you use the dot map um, high order array method. So you can basically return an array that has been mutated in some way. All right. So I want to move on to conditionals. So let's create a new file. Conditionals dot RS and we'll create our public function run. All right, so a conditional is used to con check the condition of something and then act on the result. So it's just like any other if else in any other language. Let's go ahead and bring in that file. And down here, I'll go ahead and run conditionals run. All right, now I'm going to create a variable, let's say let age and we'll set this to let's do 18. Okay, and then I'm just going to do an if else. So we'll say if age is greater than or equal to 21. Then let's do a print. Oops. Let's do a print line and all we're going to do here is output a string and we're going to say that this is from the bartender. So we'll say bartender says what would you like to drink? So pretend we're making like a silly little game here or something. Okay, so If the age is greater than or equal to 21, the bartender asks what we want to drink. So if we go ahead and run this, we get nothing because the age is 18. So if we change it to 22 and we run it. What would you like to drink now? We obviously want to handle if the person is not 21, if they're if they're you know younger than 21. So we're just going to put an else and I'll just go ahead and uh, copy that. And instead of asking what we want to drink, we'll say, sorry, you have to leave. Okay, so now we'll save that. Let's change the age back to 18 and run it and we get sorry, you have to leave. So let's add in. Um, let's look at operators. So we have and or I'm going to put a an extra variable here of check ID. Okay, we'll set that to false. Okay, and we can add types here if we want statically. So we can say uh, this is going to be a Boolean and this is going to be, let's say, an unsigned int 8 bit. All right. Now down here, we want to make sure that the bartender has checked the ID. Okay, so uh, let's do and So we can do double ampersand check underscore ID and then I'm going to change this one to an else if and we're going to say if age is less than 21 and check ID because the bartender should have checked the ID already else. Then let's do a print. So I'll grab that. And what the bartender is going to do is ask for the ID. So we'll say I'll need to see your ID. All right, so we'll save that and let's run it. So we get I'll need to see your ID because this is false. So let's say they check the ID. However, they're 18. So sorry, you have to leave. So if they check the ID and they're 30, then we get what would you like to drink now we can also do or 
Okay, so here we did and what I'm going to do is create another variable and I'm going to say knows person of age. So the bartender knows this person and they know that they're of age. Okay, someone that comes in all the time. So right here for this condition, I'm going to add in an or which is represented with a double pipe character and we'll say knows person of age. Okay, if, if this is true, then the bartender knows them and they know they're of age. So let's run that. And we get what would you like to drink now, even if we set the age to 18, if we run it, what would you like to drink? Because since this is true, this this doesn't apply. And this is kind of a silly example, but it's just to show you the syntax. Basically, it's just a regular if we don't have to put um, parentheses around this. We do use curly braces. Um, just it's very simple. So I also want to show you how to do a shorthand. And now there's no ternary operator in Rust as far as using, you know, the question mark and the colon like in many other languages. But we can do a shorthand if so. Let's go down here and let's do a shorthand if so. I'm going to set a variable and I'm going to say is of age and we'll set that to if age is greater than or equal to 21 then set that to true else set to false okay and then we'll go ahead and we'll just print line and pass in is of age actually let's put some text here let's say is of age all right so if we save that we run it we get is of age false. So it's looking at this value here. Now, if I change this to 22 and we go ahead and run this, we get is of age true. Okay, so this is how we can do a shorthand if that's similar to how a ternary operator works. All right, so those are conditionals. Um, now we're going to move to loops. Okay, so I'm going to create a new file called loops running out of time here. So I'm going to try to go kind of quick. Uh, inside main RS, let's bring in loops. So loops and then down here. Uh, let's comment that out. And loops run. Okay, so public function run. Now There's there's different types of loops, just like with many other languages. Uh, I'm just going to paste this text up here. So loops are used to iterate until a condition is met in Rust. We have what's called an infinite loop. So I'm going to show you that first. I'm going to create a mutable variable called count. We'll set that to zero and then we can simply say loop. Okay, so this is an infinite loop. And we're going to just take that count variable and we're going to plus equals one. So we're going to add one to it um, through every iteration. And then let's do a print line and we'll just put we'll print the, wor the word number. And then we'll put in the count. Okay, now this will just keep going forever if I run it like this. So we just need to put a condition here. We'll say if the count is, let's say, equal to 20 then we want to break. Okay, we want to break out of the loop. So we'll save that and run and you'll see that we'll get one through 20 number one through 20. So it's up to us when you know to write a condition down here to stop the loop. Otherwise, it'll just keep going. So next type of loop I'm going to show you is a while loop, which is very common in many languages. And I'm going to just I'm just going to do a quick fizz buzz. Okay, so if you don't know what fizz buzz is, it's a pretty popular challenge. Um, they use it in coding interviews and stuff. Basically, you want to loop through uh, 0 to 100. If the number is divisible by 3, you want to print out fizz. If it's divisible by buzz, you uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if it's divisible by five, you want to print out buzz. And if it's divisible by both, you want to print out fizz buzz. Otherwise, just print the number. All right. So let's do while the count is less than or equal to 100. OK, 
Okay, and then we want to put put some conditionals. Now remember, it needs to print out fizzbuzz if it's divisible by 5 and 3. Now a shorthand to to do that is to just see if it's divisible by 15. So we use the modulus operator, the percent sign. Um, so if it's divisible by 15, or actually if this is equal to 0, that means it's divisible by 15, because the modulus gives us the remainder. And then we're going to print line, and let's just do. say fizz buzz. Okay, and then let's do an else if and we want to check if the count modulus 3 is equal to 0. Okay, if that's true then we want to print line and let's just print out fizz since it's divisible by 3. Oops. Okay, and then we'll do another else if and we're going to test to see if the count uh, modulus 5 is equal to 0. And if that's the case, then we're going to print line. And we want buzz. Okay, else then we simply want to print out the number. So we'll just say print line and let's put in the count. Okay, now we need to increment it down at the bottom. So oops, let's say increment. So count plus equals one. All right, so that should work. I'm actually going to comment out this loop, though, just so that doesn't run. And let's see if I pass the challenge. So we'll run it. And I didn't. And that's because I put <laughs> too much JavaScript. So you want to use the double equals. Okay, so if we go up to where this started, which is right here. So we get 1 2 fizz. So remember if it's divisible by 3 we get fizz. 4 5 is buzz. 6 is fizz, 7 8 9 is fizz, 10 is buzz. 15 should be the first fizz buzz. Okay? If we keep going Uh, 30 should be the next one. 45 should be the next one. Then 60. So it looks like looks like it's working. Um, so that's a, that's a while loop. Now we also have a four range loop. So let's say four range. So I'm going to do four X in and I can say zero dot dot to 100. Okay, which is kind of cool. And I'll do the same thing here. So we'll say if uh, actually, you know what I'll do is just copy that and put that in here, except instead of count, let's do X. Okay, so we'll do the same thing, fizzbuzz, and we'll comment out this while loop. Okay, so basically it's just for whatever your um, iteration variable is in and then you can put a range like this. Okay, and we're just doing the same thing, the same fizzbuzz challenge. So let's go ahead and run it. Okay. So if we go up top here, this is just telling us that we we didn't you we're not using the count variable that we set. It's just a warning. So 1 2 fizz 4 buzz fizz 15 should be fizzbuzz good. So there we go. We have a, an infinite loop. We have a while loop. We have a four range. So we're going to go ahead and move on. So next we're going to look at functions, which we have been working with, obviously, but we're going to look at them a little more. So let's create a file called functions.rs. And in our main file, let's bring in functions. and run functions run okay so a function is just used to store blocks of code for reuse just like any other language so let's first create our run function so uh, fn run And then outside of that, I'm going to create another function. So let's create one called greeting. This is just going to be a simple example. So we'll say function greeting. And this is going to take in some parameters. So I want it to take in a greet, 
like hello, hi, something like that, and then a name. So let's do greet. And then we're going to set the type of this to be a string. So we want to do ampersand str. And then let's also do a name, which will also be a string. Okay. Now, all I want this to do is print. So we're just going to print a line here. And let's just do two of these and then we'll say. Uh, what do we want to do here, actually? Let's yeah, we'll just do that. So hello name and then we'll just say like nice to meet you. And then here we're going to put the parameters. So greet and name. So very simple. And then up here we can run the function by simply doing greeting. And we'll pass in. Hello is the greet. And let's say Jane as the name. So if we run that, we get hello, Jane. Nice to meet you. So very easy. Um, next thing I want to do is another one to just add a couple numbers. So let's do uh, function. And for this one, I don't want to just print. I want to return from it. So let's do function add. And it's going to take in, let's say, N1, so num1, which is going to be a 32 bit integer. And then it's going to take in num2, which is also I32. And then we want to return in I32. So we use an arrow syntax like this. Okay, and we set this to I32 because that's the data type that it should return. Now, to return, we can just do N1 plus N2. And we don't use a semicolon. Okay, so when we don't use a semicolon, that is telling it that, that this is what we want to return. Now, up here in run, we could uh, we could print it if we want directly the function directly, but we can also bind function values to variables. So we can do like uh, say let get underscore sum and we'll set that to the add function and we'll pass in five and five and then we'll go ahead and print the sum and we'll set that to get sum. Okay, so we'll go ahead and run that and now we get sum 10. Okay, so if you want to return something, you can simply do this. Just no um, semicolon. Now we can also do closures. Um, which are pretty handy. They're nice and compact. You can also use outside variables. So within the run function right here, let's say closure and I'm going to do let add nums. And what we want to do is set. Oops, not slashes. We want pipe characters and we're going to say N1, which is going to be an I32. And we're going to put comma and then N2, which will also be an I32. And then on the other side of the, the pipe character here, we're going to return N1 plus N2. Oops, N2. Okay, and then we're going to do a print line. And let's just say C sum for closure sum. And over here, we'll say add nums. And we'll pass in, let's say three and three. And let's save that. Okay, so if I run that, we should get C sum six. Now, what's cool about this is we can use outside variables, which we can't do with a standard function because it's block scoped. So if I do, let's say let um, N3, which I'm going to set to be an I32, which it is by default, but I'm still going to set it. Uh, and then I'll set that to, let's say, 10. Now I can go down here and I can just add it in here so I can say plus and three. Now, when we run it, we should get 16. Okay, so we get C sum 16. Okay, so pretty cool, nice and compact. Also, we can use outside variables. So those are functions. Um, next thing we're going to look at are pointers. So our pointers and references are pointer references. So let's create a file here called pointer underscore ref dot RS. Okay. Um, and let me just paste this in. So reference pointers, they basically point to a resource in memory. Um, I'm just going to bring this in here as well. 
so let's see pointers pointer ref and then let's do pointer ref run okay and then we'll create our run function so let's say pub function run now this is basically um, if we have a primitive array we can create an, a variable and point to another variable okay not just an array but any primitive value so I'm going to give you an example this is a primitive uh, primitive array so we'll say let array one equals one two three and then let's do let array two equals array one all right now I'm going to go down here and I'm going to print line and let's put in our colon question mark because I want to print out the whole array or let's just say values and then we'll do uh, let's do array actually I want to print out both so I'm going to put that and let's do array one and array two and let's see what that gives us so we'll clear this up and we'll run it so we get one two three and one two three we were able to create this array and then set array two to array one now let's try the same thing with vectors which are non primitive okay so I'm going to paste this in so this is actually from the documentation so with non primitive value with non primitives if you assign another variable to a piece of data the first variable will no longer hold that value you're going to need to use a reference which is the ampersand to point to the resource okay so let's actually grab this and let's say vector because a vector is not a primitive value and we're just going to set this these two vec and remember to set a vector we use vec exclamation before the brackets okay now down here I'm just going to let's change this to vec like that So I'm going to try to run this and you'll see we already have an error. It says use of moved value vec one value used here after move. So basically once we set vec one or vec two equal to vec one, this is no longer applies. And if I run this, we're going to get that same error. So what we need to do is use is make this a reference. Okay, so we're basically pointing to a reference and we do that with an ampersand. Okay, and we'll also have to put the ampersand down here. in front of vec one. So if I save that, you'll see the error goes away. And if I run it now, we get one, two, three and one, two, three. Okay, so you can't point directly to it if it's not a primitive value. You have to create a reference. And we've done this in other uh, files as well. Use the ampersand. All right, so I'm not going to go too much further into it. It's the, I just wanted to cover that, cover the basics of how that works. All right. So uh, next thing I want to look at is structs. Okay, structs are very important in Rust. Um, they're similar to classes, kind of. Uh, basically, you create, uh, you know, uh, members or uh, attributes, and then you can also have functions that are related to the structs. So I'm going to create a new file called structs.rs. Okay, and let's bring it into main. So structs. And bring that down. So let's save that. Let's go into structs. I'm going to paste this in. So they're basically used to create custom data types and we'll clear that up. And let's create our public function run. So I'm going to I'm going to create two different structs here in this file. First is going to be for a color, okay, an RGB color. So let's do struct color. Okay, you want to use uppercase. That's the convention and then the properties. So we're going to have red, green and blue and I'm going to set a type of U8. 
Okay, so un unsigned just means it's a positive value. 8 bit integer is 0 to 255, which is very convenient because the RGB values are 0 to 255. So let's say green. That's also U8 and then blue. Also U8. Okay, so that it's as simple as that to create a struct. Now I'm going to go. Actually, you know what we want to we want this outside of our run. So we want to put this up here. Okay, and I'm just going to say that this is a uh, traditional struct because we also have a tuple struct, which I'm going to show you as well. So down in the run, we're going to create um, a new color. So let's create a variable, a mutable variable called C and set that to color. Okay, the color struct, which takes in a red value, which I'm going to say is going to be 255, a green value, which will be zero and a blue value, which will be zero. So it's red, basically. Um, and then let's go ahead and do a print. And I'm going to say color. And then we want through I want to show all three values. So the way that we access these is with the dot syntax. So we can just say C dot red we can say C dot green and C dot blue. OK, so we'll save that. And why is this giving me an error here? Expected one of. Um, Oh, I forgot my semicolon here. OK, so we're going to run this. Now, it's just giving me this because this doesn't have to be mutable, but it's going to need to be mutable in a second. So I'm going to ignore that. And you can see we get color 255, which is the red zero and then zero. All right. Now we can change these properties or these members if we want by just simply doing C dot. And then let's say I want to change the red value to 200. OK, so if I save that. And run it now, we don't get that error and you can see red is now 200, so we can directly change these these properties right here. Now we can also create what's called a tuple struct. I'm going to use the same kind of example with the color. So let's go. Let's say tuple. Struct. And I'm going to set struct color. Uh, and then it's just, we're all we're going to put in here is the data types, which will be U8. So three. Unsigned 8 bit integers, we should probably comment this out or we're going to get some trouble. Same thing here. OK, so that's our struct now. Down here, I'm going to create a new variable. So same thing, we'll just do C. Let's do let mute C and let's set it to color and then we can just pass in our value. So let's do 255, 0 and 0. And then I can do the same thing. I can print each one. So I'm just going to put in uh, color. And three of these now, in this case, we didn't name red, green and blue. We just kind of passed in the, the values and the and the data types. So we would do C dot zero for the first one, C dot one and C dot two. OK, so we just go by the index. And then if I save this and we run it, we still we get color two, five, five, zero, zero. We can do the same thing. We can change values. OK, so instead of doing C dot red, I'm going to do C dot zero, which will grab the first one of 255 and change it to 200. So now if I run it, we get color 200 zero zero. OK, so that's th these are pretty simple examples. Um, now what I want to do is is build something a little lar a struct that has uh, functions associated with it. So let's let's actually comment this stuff out. I know it gets a little confusing with all the commented out stuff, but I want you guys to have it as a reference. So we're going to go up top here and we're going to create a person struct. OK, so we're going to say struct. 
person and person is just going to have a first name which will be a string and a last name oops last name string okay now i want to create some functions that are associated with the person struct so i'm going to go right here and say implements or impl the person struct and then we can put functions in here and the first one is going to be just to construct a person so to create a new person so it'll be a function i'm going to call it new and it's going to take in first which will call which will be a string so str and then it's going to take in last which will also be a string and it's going to return a person and then we're just going to simply say whoop we want this to be uppercase so we're going to take person and we're going to assign first name to first that's passed in now since we use string like this this uppercase s string we actually have to tack on dot two underscore string like that all right we're going to do the same thing with the last name so we'll set last name that's going to be last whatever's passed in and then we're going to set that to string like that Okay, so that's our new function. Now, let's actually use this. So down in the run, I'm just going to go below all this stuff and let's say let mutatable variable, we'll call it p, we'll set it to person colon colon new because we're calling that new function and let's pass in a first name of John and a last name of Doe. All right, so now Let's do a print. Oops, let's do a print line. And we'll say person and let's do two of these placeholders and then for the first one we're going to do p. dot first name and then p. dot last name. All right, let's save that and let's run it. Okay, so we get person John Doe. We just get this warning because this doesn't have to be mutable just yet. So, let's say that we want uh to create a method that just gets the full name. So, I'm going to go under the new function that we created and let's say get full name and we'll create a function called full name and this is going to take in ampersand self. So, self is similar to how this works in many other object oriented languages you were just basically referencing the the struct of person so you can kind of replace self with person and then this function um is basically going to return a string so we want to do that and then we're going to use format here format exclamation because it's a macro and it's similar to print line except it doesn't actually print so in here we can use the same type of formatting so we're just going to put two curly braces and the first one we want to replace with the first name so self.first name and then self.last name like that uh let's see why is that oh we don't want the semicolon cuz we're actually returning this okay so that's the full name now If we go down here where we created the person, we should now be able to get the full name. So let's do another print line. Actually, you know what? We'll just replace this. So we'll say person and then let's just have one placeholder and let's replace this with p. dot full name, which is a method, so you want to make sure you have your parentheses. Okay? So now if we run this, we should still get person John Doe instead of calling both the first name and last name property though it's calling the full name method now we can also uh mutate stuff within the struct so these properties let's say we want to change the the last name 
So let's say maybe the person, maybe it's a woman that gets married or something like that, or a man that gets married. I don't know, whatever. Who knows these days? So let's do set last name and we'll do function set last name. Okay. now since we're going to change something here, we're going to do ampersand mute. So for mutate self and then we're going to pass in, uh, let's just say last, which is going to be a string. Okay, and then we're going to say self dot last name and we want to set that to last that's passed in. But we want to add dot to underscore string like that. Okay, so I believe that should work. So now let's go down here and we created let's do Mary Doe and then I'm going to take that person object and let's say um, set last name. And then in here, let's change it to Williams. Okay, and we'll actually take where we printed the full name here. And let's whoops, let's take one of these and let's move it up here. So I want it to I want to create Mary Doe and then show the full name and then set the last name and then show the full name again. So we should get Mary Doe and then Mary Williams. So let's run it. And there we go. Okay, so we can change these properties as well. Let's create one more method up here and let's let's show the name as a tuple or set it as a tuple. So we'll say name to tuple. So we'll say function. Let's call it to tuple and pass in self. And we're going to get a tuple with two strings first name and last name. That's what it's going to return here. All right. And then we want to return. So no semicolon and we want self dot first name and self dot last name. OK, no semicolon because we're actually returning this. So now we'll go down here and let's do. Uh, let's just say. Just bring this down. And let's do P dot to tuple. And I'll just say person tuple. OK, so we'll run that. Uh, let's see what do we got here. I'm missing a parentheses. P dot to tuple. Doesn't implement display. Oh, since it's a tuple, we have to actually use the debug trait here. OK, so let's run that. And now down here, you'll see person tuple. We have Mary Williams as a tuple. All right. So hopefully that kind of gives you an idea of how structs are used. They're similar to classes in, you know, for instance, um, uh, Python and PHP, JavaScript, Java. OK, but we're going to go ahead and move on here. So we're going to close that up. And we're going to talk about enums now. So I'm going to create a new file called enums dot uh, rs and then let's create or let's point to that file. So I'll go ahead and bring that into our main rs. So mod enums and then down here. Let's do enums run. OK, so in here I'm just going to paste this in. So enums are types which have f a few definite values, um, which is very vague, but I'll show you what I mean. So we're going to first of all create our run function here. So let's say pub function run. And up above it, I'm going to create an enum type for movement. OK, so let's just pretend that this is some kind of game where we have an avatar and or, or avatars and we want them to move in certain directions. Um, so in here we have what are called variants. So we're going to have up, down, oops, comma here. So up, down, left, 
and right. Okay, so these are our variants for our enum. And then I'm going to create a function outside of the run called move underscore avatar. And this is going to take in our movement enum as um, as a parameter. So we'll say M will set the type to movement. Now, in here, we want to perform an action depending on the movement. Okay, so uh, we're actually going to use, let's say, perform action depending on info. And we're going to use something called match, which is similar to a switch. If you've ever used a switch, which is a, a type of conditional. So we're going to say match for the movement. And let's say. If the movement. So movement and we want to use double colons and you can see we have now we have this drop down. So let's say if it's up, we want to use this fat arrow right here. We want to say print line. We could do whatever we want, but I'm just going to print something out on the screen. So I'm just going to print out um, avatar moving up. Okay, so pretty simple. And let's copy this down. four times. Whoops, I put the comma on the inside. We don't want that. Okay, so we'll do up down left right B A B A start. Those of you that have that are old enough know what I'm talking about. If you played Nintendo. So, let's say down and then we have movement left and right. Okay, so that's our match. Now, down in the run, what I want to do is set a couple variables. Um, so let's do let avatar 1 and let's say we want him to move left. So we'll say movement movement left. like that. And then I'm going to have a couple more here. Let's have one move up. Right and down. All right, we'll just change the names of these variables. We'll do 2, 3 and 4. Okay, so now we want to call the move avatar function and then pass in each avatar. So let's say move avatar and this takes in a variable, let's say avatar 1. Copy this down 2, 3 and 4. And depending on what we put here is which way they're going to move. So let's go ahead and save this and let's see I already brought that in here. So let's run it. and we get avatar moving left so that would be this one right here moving up which would be avatar 2 moving right moving down all right so i know these are simple examples that aren't really practical but i just want the goal of this course is to get you familiar with the syntax you know so you can come back and you can look at how things are formatted and you can think of your own ideas um you know this is definitely just an introductory level course So the last thing I want to do is look at um, command line arguments. Basically, we can pass stuff in when we do cargo run. We can pass something in here. You could create some kind of to do list or something if you wanted to. Uh, but I'm just going to kind of show you the basics of how to get those parameters. So we're going to let's create one more file here called we'll just call it CLI for command line interface dot RS. And we're going to bring this into our main file. So let's say mod CLI and then down here. We'll say CLI run. Okay, so in CLI RS, we're going to create our run function. and i'm going to create a variable called args okay so we'll say args now i want this to be a vector so let's give it the type of vec and it's going to be a vector of strings so we're going to put some angle back brackets 
and say string. Now I'm going to be using from the standard library the env, okay, env args, which are used to get any arguments that are passed in when we run cargo run. So we can do std double colon args, and then it has something called collect, a method called collect, like that. Now, just to shorten this just a little bit, I'm going to go up here and say use std env. Um, that way we can uh, we can get rid of. Actually, I'm sorry, this should have been std env and then args like that. But now we can get rid of this and just have env. All right. Now I want to show you. what this gives us. So let's um, let's do a print and let's just say args just to kind of show you what this gives us. And we're going to use the colon question mark and then I'm going to pass in here args. Let's see if that works. Okay. so let's run just cargo run and see what that gives us. So this args right here is going to it's going to give us a vector and the first element or the first value in this vector is going to be the the target of the executable. Okay, that's always going to be the first one. Now if I pass something in like if I say cargo run hello and we run it take a look at that. So now we get a vector has the the path and then it has the hello Okay, whatever we passed in, if I say cargo run hello world, hello and world, they both get added here. Okay, so you can see we can grab that input. So I'm going to create a variable called command and I want to get, for instance, if we pass in uh, cargo run hello, I want that hello to be the command. So I'm going to set this. to args one because zero is going to be that path. So we want the one index and I'm going to clone it. So I'm going to say dot clone and I'm going to put it into that command. Okay, so now down here. Let's just see what we get when we put in command. Get rid of that and we'll say command. And we'll run that and we can see command hello. All right. Now, this should give you some some pretty good ideas on creating some kind of command line application um, after you see how to do this so we can get the command. And then what I'm going to do is create. Get rid of that. Well, actually, we'll just comment it out. Um, we're going to do an if statement here. We're going to say if command is equal to. Hello. Then let's do a print line. And let's say uh, let's actually put another variable up here with the name and we'll set the name to Brad or whatever you want to set it to. And we'll go down here and we'll say hi. Put the placeholder here. How are you? Okay, and then we want to put the name here. So now. If I save this and I go down here and I say cargo run hello, we get hi Brad, how are you? So we can check whatever that command is and then we can do something with it. Okay, let's do like an else if um, command is equal to status. Okay, and then we'll go up here and we'll put a variable. of status and I'll set that to let's say 100%. Okay, and then we'll go down here and we'll do a print and let's say status is and then we'll put status here like that. And we'll say cargo run status. We get status is 100%. All right. Uh, and then I don't know, we'll just do like an else. And we'll do a print. 
and let's just say that is not a valid command. Okay, so now if I do like cargo run high, we get that is not a valid command. All right, so I mean, I'm not going to go much further than that. I just want to kind of show you the basics of how we can grab uh, input and then we can do something based on that input. Uh, but there's there's so much more, guys. This is just scratching the surface. I know this was a long ass video, but there's so much that you can do. We didn't even get into like dealing with files and stuff like that. Um, it's Rust is a great language. It's it's pretty it's difficult compared to, you know, Python and um, JavaScript and PHP and some of the other languages. But it's very, very powerful. It's very fast. So definitely something to look further into. Uh, like I said, I do want to do something on WebAssembly. I think that that is going to be it's going to be something big in the future. Obviously, it's still in ver at the very early stages, um, but, you know, I'll, I'll be do, doing something with WebAssembly soon. So that's it, guys. If you stayed through this whole crash course, thank you. <laughs> it was very, very long. I know that. But I did want to get all these fundamentals in the course. So that's it, guys. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.